I, I think it was discussed more in retrospect than, than at the time. At the time, I, I think my parents' perception was, and that's why my father, who was really the most immediate victim of the incident, um, was, was trying to keep my mother calm down. My mother was five feet tall, and, and, uh, but had the willpower of a giant, and she was just deeply offended by what had happened. But my brother and I discussed it uh, a lot. Uh, in the aftermath of it, when we understood what had actually happened. Honestly, at the moment, we didn't understand what happened. Um, but we're not stupid. We looked around, and not only did, was there a vacancy sign on, but the parking lot was empty. There was nobody at the motel. And, and so we, we could put two and two together. And so we discussed it among ourselves. And then later, we discussed it with both of my parents. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was interesting that it had a... It had... I don't want to go into too much personal history, but it was interesting that it had a bigger impact for my brother in the sense that he, uh, just in terms of looking at him, I, there are some in the room who probably know my brother, Jim West. I mean, he looks uh, very much the native. You know, I'm mistaken for being Greek or Italian or any number of other things. And I think it registered with him for that very reason in a way that it did not, it did register with me, don't misunderstand me, but it, he was deep, more deeply affected by it personally than I was. And yet that is, as far as I'm concerned, the only time that that ever happened to us. And I, I can only imagine what it's like to have that kind of thing happen to you repeatedly growing up. Um, so, that's, uh, but that's, that's the best that I can, can remember it. Well, I, I think that there's several ways that you go at it. It, it, does require, it does require fundamental changes in how museums look at these things. I happen to be in very easy territory in, in my museum career. I'm, I'm very grateful. First, I was at the National Museum of the American Indian, where we had a very specific constituents who were immediately um, uh, in, in, in discourse and, and in interactions with us. So, so it was very easy. Even with respect, I'm sorry, I moved from the, I forgot about that. I, I better stand over here. <laughs> I signed the consent form. I'll be right here. Um, <laughs> In, in the case of the Autry, it also is, is, is relatively uh, an easy, uh, easy intellectually because the, the, um, the Autry is so much about the complexity of all of the West and it's inclusive of all of the West. So, but it, it does require mission intention on the part of the institution. And then you have to get back to this fact. And, and that is the, um, I remember when I was uh, fir first, actually before I became the director of the National Museum of the American Indian, even when I was practicing law on Pennsylvania Avenue, I was asked to uh, be on a secretarial committee at the Smithsonian Institution. And it was called the Cultural Education Committee, um, a name which I've contemplated many times since then. And what it was supposed to do was to help determine how the audiences of the Smithsonian could be more diverse. Um, the audience of the Smithsonian actually, if you compute it all, are not that diverse, quite frankly. Um, and so we worked in this committee for a while, and what occurred to me finally is, you know, if you're going to get more diverse audiences, you have to have something in this museum where those audiences see themselves in coming into the institution. And, and that requires it's simply the faces that people see, the stories that are being told inside the institution, have a rather direct relevance to the people you're trying to get into the building. Um, and then the third point I would make is that my own conception, and it's a personal one, not by no means do all museum directors agree with it, um, is this idea of the museum as a forum, as a gathering place. Um, as a place where, where unsafe ideas are safe for purposes of discussion. It takes on a civic role, it's social space too, in addition to being a cultural destination. And if the community sees a museum in that way, then it again opens up doors and windows that previously have been closed. It becomes much less elitist in its perception, in the perception of it uh, from the outside. I think those things are taking place, I really do. I mean, even in the time I have been a museum director, which now is about a quarter of a century, there has been a vast change in how museums do business in this regard, and that includes all the way up the line. It is history museums, quite obviously, and I think most, they were kind of first in line in that way.
Um, but it now is reaching even into institutions where that kind of intercourse and bilateralism was really not nearly so apparent and where this, the elitist title or, 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 or description pertain more, such as art museums. You know, they, they, even they are moving in these kinds of directions to do different kinds of things, both in terms of the subjects with which they deal, as well as how they program themselves and their educational programs. So there, there's progress being made, I think, and I'm sure that it can be made here too. I, the examples I know best are ones where I think it does occur, and that is MIAC. Uh, which uh, Bruce uh, was previously the director of and which my good friend Della Warrior is now the director of. I think that there is a very important respect in which Native people feel at home in that place. And that was true of the NMAI. Um, so it's not impossible to do it, but you have to work at it a little bit sometimes. I agree with that. I agree with all of that. And I consider them both to be pea, uh, peas in the same pod because um, the treaties exhibit at the, uh, uh, at the National Museum of the American Indian, for which I obviously congratulate my uh, good friend, my successor, my former law partner, Kevin Gover, uh, who is the director there now, is immensely successful. Um, I would just use the drop note that, that the idea for the exhibit actually occurred while I was still there, and we, we began it then. <laughs> but he's the one who finished it, and it was, it was complicated to finish. But both are examples of what I'm saying. And notwithstanding what I said in trying to set up the progression of things uh, in, my, in my presentation, the fact is that even at the time, and that's the reason why we were doing it, in thinking about the treaties exhibit, even while I was still the director, it was this notion that somehow you have, if, if, you, if you feel you have made substantial progress toward putting um, an authoritative and authentic native voice in place, then you take the next step, and it really turns into, it really turns into a, a more multifaceted conversation. You honor the distinctiveness of each of the voices, but it becomes, in the end product, something that has this sense of interconnection, interrelationship, interweaving. And, and I think that that exhibit does it. It does it very clearly, in a way, by having the, um, the, the way that the exhibit is set up. You know, there's one response from the native side and another one from the other, but it's more subtle than that. And, and it does have this interweaving characteristic that I'm describing. I think that the Civil War exhibit um, probably in even as complex or even more complex territory. First of all, you're talking about the Civil War in the West, which nobody thinks happened. You ask most people where the Civil War happened, and they don't talk about the West. And so you have that to begin with, but then you, you go through that and you figure out, I mean, the, the, the Civil War in the West dramatically affected Native people. It affected immigration. It had all kinds of impacts in the West. And it is, is those stories that you're trying to bundle in a way that, that honors, honors the, and, 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 and presents the voices that are there, but nevertheless, in the end, is trying to weave a product together, an experience for, for the members of the, the audience or all the audiences who see it, that somehow is, is a whole, as I said in the presentation, that is greater than the sum of its parts. That's the trick. If you, if you simply do those kinds of exhibitions in a way which simply lines up the categories next to one another and you're just doing it in one exhibit, that doesn't achieve the same thing. What I'm talking about is when those constituencies within one exhibit begin talking with each other, if you will, and begin, from a curatorial standpoint, putting, being, putting touch with one another. And to your question, I think both the treaties exhibit at NMAI and Empire and Liberty at the Autry do that and do it very effectively. Well, uh, you're making an assumption about, about the Autry which really isn't quite true, which is to say that uh, the Autry is really not in the business necessarily of, of uh, constructing master narratives internally. And, and that is what I meant when I said that such an exhibit really has to be inclusive. And by inclusive, I mean reaches to the outside. That was a revolution, really, that the National Museum of the American Indian fought, was this notion, and it was never accepted in certain quarters, uh, 
There's one of my favorite critics at the New York, and I, I guess he's at the Wall Street Journal now, but at the New York Times, with whom I used to go back and forth about this through time, and and there was just there was just in his mind no way that curatorial authority could ever sit outside the four walls of a museum. The NMAI was premised on the notion that that was not true, that there was authority, curatorial authority, which sat outside as well as inside. In the uh, the reinstallation of of the uh, native galleries, really, um, at the Autry, the, which will open in in late uh, 2016, um, there is inclusion in the sense that it is not just the curators within the institution, but it is people whom we consistently have worked with from the native community from the beginning of the process, who remain in the process, who will also be involved in that, and you see their voice. You see their voice quite literally and explicitly on the exhibit floor. So it is, um, you, you, you cannot forget the second step that I was talking about in order to get successfully to the, to the third. In other words, the second step, which is to recognize and give legitimacy to, to, um, to voices of interpretation and representation, um, cannot be washed out when you go to the third step. If that happens, then you're not successful. But it's possible for that to happen. And I think most curators are, are receptive to that now. I can remember back in the early 90s having spirited conversations, I guess I would call them, with some members of the curatorial staff at the NMAI. Bruce was not among them. Bruce, Bruce was on my side. Um, but that has changed. And I think it, it's partly, it's just generational. I think, amongst curators and the way that they're being educated in graduate school about these things. Um, so I, it's, not, it's not a done deal, but, but there's a lot of change and a lot of progress in that way, which pleases me greatly. Now, if I understand your question correctly, it is that with respect to uh, Native people, uh, there was historically, even in the 19th century and perhaps even before, intersection with the African American community. Uh, and that is true. And interestingly enough, that was a story, one of the first conversations I had when I came to the NMAI was with the then director of the Anacostia Museum, which, if you know the Smithsonian at all, is a community museum in, in the, that grew up out of the Anacostia section of Washington, D.C., that was tied on a community basis directly to the African-American community. And he and I discussed at that point that before we both left the place, we were going to have some kind of exhibit that addressed black Indians. And we did. We did. That happened just as I was going out the door, but it happened. And then that traveled. In fact, it traveled actually out to uh, Albuquerque, as I recall. And that is a story that neither community for a long time was comfortable talking about. And yet, if you're talking about the interstitial tissues of history, that certainly is a big one. And it is especially so in Oklahoma when you have all of these complexities where on the one hand, which shows up in the Empire and Liberty exhibition at the Autry, the last Confederate general to surrender was Stan Wadey, who was a Cherokee chief. Um, and the Cherokees were comprised of people who opposed slavery and supported abolitionism and yet hundreds of slaves came west with the Cherokees, who were also plantation owners uh, in the southeastern part of the United States. And then, in addition to that in Oklahoma, you have the fact that when it looked like that would not remain Indian territory forever, there was a movement on the heels of the Civil War that that could become a black state. There's all this floating around in, in, in Oklahoma history, and Oklahoma wouldn't deal with it either for a long time but they have in more significant ways within just the past, the past decade or so. But, but this, this is what I mean. And so there is both scholarship and there are exhibitions that go directly to the story that you're talking about. Belatedly, should have been a long time ago, but it has happened. And it is, but it is those threads of history that, that I think are important and that give, it, it's the stories you don't know, the stories you haven't heard about, the stories that are a surprise to you sometimes, which is what we are trying to get at at the Autry in trying to enrich, if you will, this approach to cultural history.
in what it is. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a demanding task, it truly is, but it is where museums that do this kind of work should be, as far as I'm concerned, at the present time. And even with respect to the subject you mentioned, we're in a better place than we were as recently as 10 to 15 years ago. You're welcome. I hope so. Uh, that's interesting. I've never had somebody ask me that question exactly that way. Let me tell you what peace chiefs do, supposedly, to begin with. Um, peace chiefs are exactly what the name implies. And indeed, in Cheyenne, the words are peace chief, not just chief. And uh, peace chiefs, and you're instructed about this. And, and I didn't become a peace chief until, you know, like 10 to 15 years ago. And uh, you're not born to it at all. There's nothing hereditary about being a Cheyenne chief. And it's, it's kind of based upon uh, what, they, what the chiefs consider your particular merits to be. And, um, but there is an obligation, there are about two or three obligations that are terribly important. One is that you are expected to keep peace in the community. And you give anything you have, um, not just only to that end, but anything that sort of holds the community together. You are at the call of the community. Um, you are not elevated in any sense above the community. You are really at their call. And that is your, that is your highest obligation. And, and I guess I would say, and I, I, it, it does have something to do, it does have something to do with the way I, I, I manage and lead, I, I think. I think that there, there, there is a reference. I tend to be very um, inclusive and um, uh, uh, less, less it's, it's in some ways less the way that lots of America is led in the corporate sector. It, it is inclusive and, and, and consensus driven, if you will. That's the way chiefs make decisions. We do not hold up our hands. We talk until everybody in the teepee agrees about something. Now, sometimes you can't talk forever in a museum until everybody agrees, but, but it, it is, uh, it's better sometimes than, than uh, making decisions based upon fiat. So, so there's a, there, there is a cultural crossover. It also has to do with other aspects of my personality, I think. But, but no, I think that there is a similarity. And, and especially when you're, I'll tell you the other thing I, I feel, and that is that I, I look at those qualities, which I think are, are in my skill set, and I meditate on them more, because my positions have been, A, doing a startup museum at the National Museum of the American Indian when everything is, is brand new. And if you can't bring everybody with you as you go, you are in deep yogurt almost immediately. And then on the other hand, the Autry, in my view, even though it is an ongoing institution, has been since the late 1980s, which is still relatively young for an American museum, is nevertheless, in my view, and this is the basis on which I was recruited by certain people, some of whom actually sit in this room, uh, is in a transformational moment. And it is, it is completed its first quarter century of life, and now we think about the second quarter century. And what does that mean? And what are we really trying to be? And that was what led to the very um, enlightened, I think, uh, seminal uh, strategic plan that, in my review of it coming into the job, was among the principal reasons I came, because I thought that thing. So that is, again, a change making moment. And I think the change making moments emphasize leadership which has to be inclusive. You have to make sure that you are, that everybody is coming with you. Uh, leadership is much more important in those situations than management, as far as I'm concerned. Leaders must also be managers, at least to some degree. But the kind of institutions I've been in, it's where leadership has probably been the critical, critical factor in the skill set of the person at the head of the organization. Thank you very much, and I'll see you out in the lobby. Thank <laughs> you.